We're just one day away from the start of spring practice for Notre Dame, and there are plenty of questions we hope will get answered over the next few weeks, including which players have the most to prove. It's coming right up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome into Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Wednesday, March 6th, and thank you for getting your day started right here by making this your first listen of the day. My name is Tyler Wojak and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018 and now I'm a producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And this show is free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. If you are watching along on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up below and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to the pod, please take a second to rate the show five stars, leave a nice review and subscribe. It might not seem like a lot, but I promise it goes a long way in helping grow this show. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. As I said at the top of the show, Notre Dame officially kicks off string practice tomorrow, and in just a moment here, I'm going to be joined by Greg Flamung from Irish Sports Daily to do a full-blown spring practice preview. I can't wait to see the Irish back out on the practice field and get to watch some real live action once again, even if it's just 15 practices, and even though we're still very far away from the actual season, I'll take what I can get at this point in the offseason. So to break it all down, here's Greg. All right, I'm joined now by Greg Flamon. Greg is a great friend of the program, but it's actually been a while since the last time you came on the show. Do you remember when that was? Uh, No, I don't, actually. (laughs) When was it? So it was actually right before the USC game, and I felt like as Southern California residents, it made the most sense to do uh, a SoCal preview for the game against Southern California. And the vibes were not high. <laughs> we were pretty down in the dumps. We didn't know that Notre Dame would end up dominating Caleb Williams and yeah. USC at home, and it would end up being a great win. Now, USC would end up finishing 7-5 to in the regular season, so it really right. wasn't that great of a win. But that was the last time you were on. So welcome back, man. It's great to have you. Well, hopefully, I mean, I portended great things. Hopefully, uh, we have a break, great spring coming up then. Exactly. Opinion. <laughs> yeah, like you really changed the vibe there, and uh, I think we we both picked Notre Dame to lose. It was it was really bad. I think that might have had more to do with our own just like uh, self sabotage. I don't even know what you want to call it. But anyway, I mean, yeah, they didn't they didn't look good in the in no. the previous game. So it was like three days after Louisville, we were still right. reeling from that. Yeah. But now it's a much different situation. Uh, Notre Dame has had a really strong off season so far. They were able to add some key pieces in the transfer portal. This recruiting class is the chance to be something special. And I feel like the coaching staff, at least the assistants, is about as strong as it's been in some time. So there's a lot going right right now for Notre Dame. But now that we have some actual football to talk about with spring practice set to start on Thursday, what is the biggest question that you have that you think could actually be answered by the end of spring practice? Uh, could be answered by the end of spring. Um, I was going to say the offensive line. I don't, I don't know how much clarity we'll have there though. Uh, that'll be interesting. Um, I mean, I guess if, if there's some solidification there, like if, if if it's pretty clear who the tackles are going to be, at least, I think that would be interesting. Um, I think if, if Billy Shrouth is kind of ingrained in one of those spots, I doubt that the fifth line spot would be like the guards, like the other guard spot. I feel like I feel like Billy Strouth is going to be one of the guards, but so I, I think between uh, between uh, Rocco Spindler's coming back from injury, you got Rock, um, you've got Pat Coogan who who played um, almost every snap at left guard last year. Um, I feel like that is going to be kind of up in the air there. Uh, can someone else come in? Can Sam Pendleton make a run there? Uh, does Ashton Craig have a have a handle on the center position like is that going to be his position i feel like that's the one where i think people have the most questions and most concerns i wonder if we could get some clarity there um as far as you know anything beyond that like getting an answer what the wide receivers like is chris mitchell like is he is he going to make a seamless transition into you know power five college football right like he's coming from fiu you know he's a good speed guy there but can he can that translate to 
uh, you know, the University of Notre Dame against Notre Dame's corners. He's going to be tested very heavily against uh, the likes of Ben Morrison, Christian Gray, Jaden Mickey, Clarence Lewis, guys like that. So um, that'll be interesting to see. Um, I, I think that's probably it, right? And, and at least on the offensive side of the ball, right? Um, and then, like, you know, how, how does – Riley Leonard look, right? How does he look in a in a Mike Dembrock offense, right? How does he look when he's asked to push the ball a little bit more? It's a little bit more wide open, right? There's going to be a little bit more on his plate than he, what he had at Duke. So that'll be interesting to track as well. Yeah, I'm with you on the offensive line. I don't think we're going to get uh, complete clarity there. I mean, you think yeah. about what happened last year. Going into fall camp, it looked like Shrouth and Kristovich were going to be the guards and then it ended up being Coogan and Spindler. Because we all thought that because Shrouth and Kristovich were getting most of the first team reps throughout spring and then um, it completely changed the spring practice. But I'm with you. I, I would hope that we get some clarity there. Like if it's Shrouth solidifies his spot at one of the guard positions, Ash and Craig, he's got a tough task going up against Howard Cross right. and Riley Mills every single day. But if he's able to hold his own against those two guys, then he's going to be in great shape. But I feel like the tackles and the question marks surrounding that position is probably going to last uh, deep into fall camp, most likely. But you mentioned Mike Denbrock. I feel like these next few weeks are going to be critical for him as he implements or implements his new offensive scheme. I don't think we're going to see like a ton of advanced stuff on that side of the ball yet because they need to figure out the basics first. But what are you hoping to see from the offense schematically over the next month? I mean, he mentioned a lot more 11 personnel. I want to see what that looks like. Like where, where is everyone kind of lining up there? Um, how, how, how big of a role, like Jaden Harrison's, there's been a little bit of buzz about him in the last, you know, a couple days here, like maybe last week, where, where does he fit? Right. Uh, like where does Jaden Thomas fit in there? Do they have him playing mostly in the slot? Do they have him uh, playing to the boundary or to the field? Like where does, you know, where does Deion Colsey fit in this? Uh, where, where, do, where do they have Jaden Greathouse playing? Right. Do they want him on the boundary? Do they want him in the slot? I think that'll be interesting to see, uh, I, you know, is, is Eli Raritan, is he going to be like a, like the guy at tight end with Mitchell Evans still out with the knee injury? Um, and then obviously the running back rotation, I think that's going to be pretty, you know, pretty, pretty well locked in, right? Like we know Jadarian Price can play. We know Jeremiah Love can play. We know Jabron Payne can play. What are we going to see from the freshman? That'll be interesting. Um, and so some of the, just some of the formations, right. And some of, some of the, the zone read stuff that we saw in 2015, 2016, and then some of the things we've seen at Cincinnati, right? I doubt they're going to be doing a lot of QB run stuff, like design QB run stuff, just because that's the nature of spring. But anything like that could would, would be interesting, right? How they're going to implement that. How much RPO stuff are they running? Um, that's kind of what I'm interested to see, right? Are they trying to push the ball down the field a lot in spring? Are they trying to be aggressive throwing the ball? That's kind of interesting just in terms of, how they want to attack teams, right? I, I feel like Notre Dame's been so double tight end heavy, so heavy, uh, you know, heavy set in the last couple of seasons. Like Mike Denbrock came out right away and says, and we're going to see a lot more 11 personnel. And the 2015 offense, it's like, that's what I think about all the time when I think of the 11 personnel packages that he's run. Saw some really wide open stuff there. Now, of course, you have Will Fuller, so that, that'll be interesting to see if uh, if they can do that with without him on the, on the roster. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch the offense and how they sort of approach everything, especially considering the fact that Riley Lenders is expected to be a huge uh, asset in the running game, but you really can't do a ton with that in spring right. practice because he's going to be wearing a red jersey. And the QB situation today feels a lot like it did last year. It's going to be called a quarterback competition, even though nobody really thinks it's an actual competition, and I do expect it's going to be wrapped up by the blue and gold game, even if it's not as one-sided as it was last year with the way that Sam Hartman completely outperformed Tyler Buckner in, in the blue and gold game. Maybe not so much throughout the entire spring practice session, but after that game, that, competi that competition was over. So how do you see the battle between Leonard and Angeli playing out over the course of the next few weeks? I, th I think it's kind of like you said, like... I it's very hard for Steve Angeli to to kind of bridge the gap in athleticism. You know, it, it the the legs of Leonard are just something that are an X factor in the offense period, right? Like you want that, and I think that it adds so much to what Notre Dame wants to do in the running game as well. It's just going to be very hard for for Steve Angeli to compete with that. In in a lot of ways, to me, 
the the more interesting kind of storyline with the quarterbacks as far as the competition goes is between Minchie and Angeli, right? And Minchie's gotten a lot of buzz in the last couple of weeks as well. And and I know Notre Dame likes him a lot. I know they like Steve Angeli a lot, right? Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman has been pretty clear about this. They don't want to be a portal team at the quarterback position after this season. And I feel like those two guys are going to be the ones jockeying for that spot, right? They don't – it. The guy who wins the job post 2024 is going to, you know, essentially be the quarterback for a couple of years, or at least that'll be the plan. Right. So I, th- I think that'll be the one to track. Right. I, I think can Angeli hold off Minchie and kind of solidify himself as like, Hey, I'm the incumbent. I'm going to be the one who takes over when Riley Leonard a leaves the program or if he were to go down, you know, for, you know, you run around a lot. You're, you're exposing yourself to hit. Something could happen. So that'll be interesting to track. It's just like what happens with the backup guys. You know, it, does Minchie make a run at Angelia? I think that's something that everyone should be watching. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great segue into the next question I want to ask you because there's a lot of guys on offense who have a lot to prove this spring, and Kenny Minchie is one of the leaders among them because if he's not able to really crack the two deep, in this spring practice, there's a good chance that he might be out the door. Um, there's also other guys have uh, who have a lot to prove, but for different reasons. I mean, I feel mm-hmm. like Jadarian Price is another example where, like, if he's going to be the guy carrying the ball, um, he's got to have a big spring practice. I think he will. So who are some guys, do you think, that have the most to prove this spring on offense? Uh, I think, well, it just, I mean, you mentioned that kind of the running backs a little bit. I mean, Jabron Payne is kind of one, right? Like, there's two freshmen in – in the lineup where it's like they're that Kedron Young and Aeneas Williams, like they're on, like they want to be the third down back too. Javon Payne was the third down back last year. Like he kind of has to solidify that job. I think, I think it's certainly a lot of fans were not super happy with him being that just guaranteed third guy. Not that he played terrible or anything like that, but you feel like maybe there's better out there, right? Is that still going to be his job? Can Kedron Young come in and take some of his snaps? Right. Can Aeneas yeah. Williams come in and take some of his snaps? Like he has something to prove there. Uh, I think all the wide receivers kind of like they have a lot to prove, right? <laughs> the position um, has a lot to prove. They do, right? I'm with I mean, you. I, I, yeah. There, there's, there's Notre Dame wants to be a wide open team. They want to throw the ball more. Well, you got to, you, you got to be open, right? Like you got to be able to make plays. Mike Dembrock is very good at scheming guys into good matchups, right? But you do have to take, advantage of those matchups right just because you have a good matchup doesn't mean you're winning them all the time uh i mentioned i mentioned eli raritan before right can he you know he, he he it's not like he played all last year right like he came in halfway through because he had an inj- injury of his own uh he's had a couple knee injuries actually so like is he going to be able to kind of be the guy there and, and it's like okay this is i'm gonna be tight end one until mitchell evans comes back and even beyond that right so there's something there. I think Charles Jagusaw, lot to prove, right? Like there's, they put him at left tackle for the bowl game. Are you going to be the left tackle for, you know, the next three years, the next two years, right? Like, is that going to be your spot? Like there's got to be stuff there. So um, there's a, there's a lot going on on offense. There's a lot to be happy about, but there's a lot to track. Let me tell you. We'll be right back with Greg to talk more about Notre Dame spring practice, but I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you about Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With great deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all of the fun you're going to have. I recently used Game Time to go to a concert. It wasn't even in the plans initially, but then I looked at the prices on Game Time, and I was like, you know what? I'm in. I went and had a great time. All thanks to Game Time. It is the fastest-growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. You get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Plus, you can buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Just two taps and you're set, and the tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. When it comes to the tackles, I think you could say Jagasaw, Tosh Baker, or Emil Wagner. All of those guys have a lot to prove, and I think that Notre Dame's approach to the transfer portal uh, following spring practice, when the portal opens up again, and how Notre Dame approaches that when it comes to the tackles is going to tell me a lot about how 
those three guys performed. Now, if it's a situation where there's a guy out there who is an obvious take, and Notre Dame is like, oh, we can get this guy, let's take him, that's one thing. But if they're going out and they're grabbing some guy from, like, I don't know, San Diego State who didn't really look that great but has some experience, I'm going to feel uh, even worse about that position than I already do. I also think that Jane Greathouse is a guy um, at wide receiver who really has a lot to prove because I think we're all very high on him. He had some really great moments last year when he wasn't dealing with that hamstring injury. There's other guys like Jane Thomas, like you kind of know what you're going to be getting with him, but Great House is a chance to be something really special, and hopefully we start to see that this spring. But we have talked a lot about the offense right now. Let's shift it over to the defense, um, and specifically the linebacker position, because J.D. Bertrand and Maris Leofau took up so many reps over the past two years at linebacker, and for good reason. Like, that's not a complaint. Uh, Bertrand specifically was incredible throughout his career. And even though Notre Dame is bringing back a veteran in Jack Kaiser, I'm really curious to see how L. Golden modifies his scheme, or if he modifies his scheme to take into account the fact that he's going to be playing a lot younger, inexperienced linebackers. So what do you expect to see from that side of the ball this spring and potentially a change in their approach on defense? Well, I think they'll stick with the nickel base for sure. Um, I think that'll be something that's, we're going to see, you know, Jordan Clark out there a lot. We're going to see Clarence Lewis out there a lot or, you know, whoever else is working in that nickel spot. I think they're going to stick with that. I think they're very comfortable with that. Um, And it makes sense given, you know, the type of defense that they play and the type of teams that they play, frankly. Um, you know, where where is just Jalen Sneed? Can he be a, a, a full time will? Right. Can, can that be a real thing? Can, uh, can Drake Bowen kind of go in there at, at the mic? And is he is he a viable player on a, on a you know, a game to game basis? Right. You're going to give him 30, 40 snaps a game. Is Jack Heiser? Is he can he be uh, someone who can start and be the leader and kind of just the voice of that defense? Right. I think that was something that J.D. Bertrand, you know, people people don't like it when it's like a guy can in there and run the defense and they, they think Joe Schmidt all the time and you need your linebacker to be in charge. Right. And I think JD Bertrand definitely was that. And, you know, obviously I think he was a lot better player than Joe Schmidt was like there. That's kind of a pejorative and it doesn't need to be right. But can Jack Kaiser fill that role? Can he be kind of the best linebacker on the field and also be the voice of the defense? That that'll be something interesting to see there. Um, you know, as far as changes to the defense, it, it I think a, a big part of that is the development of a Don Schuler, right? Because you you have Rod Hurd who's going to be coming in, but he's not on campus yet, and so he's he's not available for Notre Dame. He can't participate in spring ball. He's going to be there in in the, in the fall when when fall fall camp starts. Can a Don Schuler? Can he develop enough to where it's like okay, he's going to be our third safety? Notre Dame loves playing three safeties. Right? Can he be that guy? I think he's going to get the first crack at it. I think when when the first team defense goes out there, I think he'll be next to uh, he'll be next to Xavier Watts because you know DJ Brown, Ramon Henderson, yeah. DJ Brown. Someone's got to <laughs> out of out of eligibility and DJ and, and Ramon Henderson's at UCLA, so someone's got to be out there, right? And I think that he's kind of one where if if they don't feel confident in him and they maybe they can't play those three safeties, right? Like maybe that's something that they can't do. Um, and so that that's going to be interesting to see in terms of the difference in defense. And, you know, last year, just kind of the last point, um, and another difference is that we saw they played a ton of man last year, ton of man defense, right? They were very comfortable with Thomas Harper and man. They were very, obviously very comfortable with Ben Morrison and Cam Harden, man. Cam Hart's gone. You still like to play Ben Morrison and man, that's no problem. But can you, can Jaden Mickey hold up there? Can Christian Gray hold up there? Right. That's going to be something to monitor. It, could Jordan Clark hold up there. Can Clarence Lewis like that's something if Notre Dame, if if Al Golden doesn't feel completely comfortable playing man with these guys, that's going to lead to some changes in the defense. That'll be interesting to track as well. Yeah. And you you've already sort of alluded to this already. I was going to ask, you know, which players on defense are you most excited to watch? Because, you know, even though Notre Dame returns a ton of production on that yeah. side of the ball, there's still there's still some question marks on defense. You mentioned a few of them. I think safety. It's a little bit weird to say it's a big question mark right now because they bring back Xavier Watts, who's one of the best safeties in all of college football last season, despite the fact that he somehow wasn't a semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. 
different story for a different time. Yeah. And then they're going to have a guy like Hurd who's just not around um, during spring practice. And it's going to be the same on the offensive side of the ball. Bo Collins is also not going to be participating in right. spring practice with the receivers. So those are two guys who you can count on being there in the future. But now you get a chance to look at some young guys. But I feel like Jordan Botello has a lot to prove as well. Um, he's been around for a long time, brings back a ton of experience. But um, – if he doesn't have like an Esmar Bilal type leap season, whatever you want to call it, I have a feeling that he could get jumped. Maybe not at the start of the season, but at some point by younger guys like maybe uh, Abubakor Traore uh, or some other some other player because you know he just Notre Dame needs a lot of production at the Viper. They need some explosive plays. So you know, but tell us one guy who I'm really going to be looking closely at over the spring. Who sticks out to you? Uh, but Toho is a good, a good example. Right. And that's, it's a good point because, you know, it's it, Josh Burnham is there as well. So you got Bubakar Traore, who they're very excited about Josh Burnham, who they're very excited about. You know, he was one of those 2022 class guys that came in that everyone was very excited about. Uh, Junior Tula Halamaka is another one where it's like, well, how do you fit in here? You know, like he's got to fight for reps as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, but as well, like, if he's if he can't show what he showed, you know, kind of in 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 limited reps in 2022, he he was one of the more dynamic pass rushers on the team, you know. And last year it just wasn't there. Um, there was some kind of chatter about some injuries. Maybe he was carrying an injury all year, you know. Not really sure about that, but if that was the case, then we, you know, the the the, the team needs to see more of that kind of that dynamic pass rush ability from him. And if he doesn't show it. Josh Burnham is there. Bubakar Traore is there, right? You have RJ Oban on the other side. So like they're going to have a lot of pass rushers or at least, at least guys who, you know, pretend to be pass rushers. Right. So that'll be interesting to track there. Um, obviously we kind of know what we're getting from Howard Cross. We, come, we know what we're getting from Riley Mills inside. Uh, but you, you've got some other guys in there. Uh, can, can they bring something, right? Can, can they add something inside? Maybe a Donovan Heinish. Right, as you know, guys like that. Um, so Jason Anya is another guy, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm really like, excited to see what he can do, Anya, right? And then you have Brennan Vernon, right? Yeah, what, what's he, what's he, what's he got in the tank there, right? What's it, what's what can he bring? Can Tyson Ford bring something, right? It's a very big spring for him as well. Am I a viable player at Notre Dame, right? So there's a lot to track there, but I think the defensive ends, though, they're gonna be really like is is there something there where Notre Dame has guys on like first and 10 who can get after the quarterback and Notre Dame doesn't have to do a bunch of sim blitzes like we see on third down that's it's a good thing to do on third down because it's you know they're kind of throwing but on first down you can run and throw can you get pressure in, in that kind of situation since we're on the topic of pass rushers Jalen Sneed is very good at getting after yeah. the passer, but Notre Dame needs him to be a little bit more than that. They need him to be a complete linebacker. He came into Notre Dame with a ton of hype, five-star prospect, top-rated recruit in his class. But from day one, I think everyone had an understanding that Snead had some developing to do physically because he came in underweight, and we knew that he was a really explosive athlete, but it was going to take some time. Okay, so now we're entering year three with him. To me, this spring kind of feels like now or never. And I don't want to say that, oh, he's going to, you know, transfer after spring like Prince Collie or anything like that. But it's kind of getting to the point where if Snead is going to be that type of player, like a really, really talented high-end linebacker, if we don't at least start seeing signs of that in spring, I'm just giving up on that ever being a possibility. And I feel like he'll still be a factor. He could be an impact player on third down coming off the edge in different packages, but he's just never going to be the all around great linebacker that we thought he could be someone like uh, Jeremiah Owusu Koromo. Am I getting a little bit ahead of myself there or do you kind of feel the same way? Well, I think it's true just because there are so many options around him right like drake bowen is there he could play well uh kingston villa he could play well right um jaden osbury could play well Preston zinter could play well they have a lot of options right so I, I think that what you said is true he'll always have some kind of a role within yeah. the defense a big role right i mean i i think he'll be in sub packages in 2024 yeah, no like no question uh, but you're right. Like if he doesn't show the aptitude to 
uh, re, you know, make the proper reads, make the proper run fits, right? Uh, be disciplined, uh, track the ball, be, be an, a, a, someone who can play, make darting into the backfield, right? Like making those kind of reads. If he can't do it now, there are other players who can, who are going to pick it up. Like they have a lot of talent at linebacker. So it is, it is a kind of a time where, you know, people have pointed out like this is, the, he's on the JOK timeline. JOK did not uh did not really it didn't really click for him until his third year. Right now, Jalen Steen's going into his third year, right? So you don't want to A, you don't want to panic. It, it's it, it's kind of funny. We're we're in a don't panic, but also like be urgent type of situation <laughs> with him. Yeah. It's like it, it does need to happen and it does need to happen soon, but it, he's not like either behind schedule per se either. So uh, it, it's something to monitor. And I will say like, there has, again, there's been some chatter about him having kind of like, he's starting to turn that corner. At least the, the people around the program feel that. So that'll be something very interesting to monitor throughout the spring. Yeah. I don't expected him to come out of spring practice. Like, Oh my God, Jalen Sneed, he's figured it all out. He's going to be amazing this season. I just need to see something. Cause we haven't really seen a whole lot of that yet. Greg and I still have more to get to, including our bolt predictions for spring practice. But first, I want to tell you about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to turn your car into the mvp and bring home that win keep a ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers eligible items only exclusions apply okay we haven't even really talked about the young guys and i think that's uh, one of the most exciting parts of spring practice, all the early enrollees, all the transfers who are actually going to be a part of the team. I mean, CJ Carr kind of already started his Notre Dame career when he participated yeah. in the bowl prep, but now uh, this is his first real action. So there's a ton of new guys. Notre Dame is going to have a bunch of early enrollees plus some new transfers. Which newcomer are you my, most excited to watch? Uh, most excited? I guess I'm, I'm excited to hear about uh, you know, Micah Gilbert and Cam Williams. Is there something there where it's like they're gonna they're gonna contribute in 2024? Because I think in previous years, like we kind of saw with Tobias Merriweather, it was like, well, I really hope so because there's no one else. You know, we need there's, no, there's no one else. <laughs> there was really actually expectations and pressure, like, hey, yeah. you have to figure this out or else right. we have no and, one. And it was and it was kind of the same with uh Rico Flores and Jaden Greathouse, right? Like we we yeah. need this because there's there's not a lot in front of you. I think with Cam Williams and and Micah Gilbert now, there are guys in front of them. Guys who can play and guys who have played well, you know, at Notre Dame or in college football before them, right? So if they're not fully capable yet, then that's okay, right? But if 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 you know we start to hear like hey they're gonna have to they're gonna have to find a way to get these guys on the field like that'll be interesting very interested to see Kedron Young right can he be someone who takes carries like Jeremiah Love right like I think Jeremiah Love when he came in it was like hey they really like how he's running the ball and they're gonna have to get him involved right so there was a lot of buzz about him and I think KVA is another one where it's just kind of there's a lot of buzz about him in just terms of like where he is. Uh, physically, like he's physically ready to go if he can pick up the defense. Uh, Max Buller was talking about how, you know, KVA played a shell kind of cover, uh, shell defense of what Alabama runs at St. John Bosco. Seems like he can pick things up really quickly. So I would say those those four people are are the guys that I'm kind of monitoring in, in terms of. And then, and then Br Br uh, Bryce Young as well, right? Does he have something? Can he show the ability to get off the edge and, 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 attack the quarterback because if yes they're going to find a way to get him on the field as well yeah if Bryce Young is getting reps and third down packages at any point during the fall that's incredible because yeah. of all the experienced guys that Notre Dame has in front of him right. it would be totally warranted by his talent level and on offense I think you know there's a chance for guys like Cam Williams Micah Gilbert Keijah Jong maybe even Aeneas Williams to make a dent and it it sort of suits 
uh, early playing time for freshmen, specifically those positions, and running back because we know Dylan McCullough likes to rotate. I'm obviously very high in KVA, and the way that people talk about him out here in Los Angeles is like he is going to be a player from day one. It's just a little bit hard for me to imagine a true freshman linebacker. It's not like it's never happened before, and I still think, you know, KVA is going to get on the field this year, but do you see a path for him to eventually take over a starting linebacker job? Is that realistic, or do you think that's maybe fans getting a little bit too excited about a young, very promising freshman? Without injury? I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, because I could see him being a part of the rotation, right? I could see him getting some some will snaps or some mic snaps to where it's like hey it, it kind of like christian gray last year where it's like you're getting in the game i don't care where it is i don't care what if we're at clemson or we're at texas and you're getting in the game like we're, we're definitely playing you it doesn't have to be a blowout it doesn't have to be you know at home or any of that stuff we're putting you in the game i could see that but it's just like they're probably going to put him at Mike and they're probably going to put him behind Jack Kaiser. Jack Kaiser's probably going to be a captain, right? It, it just to take to take the starting job away from someone like that would just be he would he would he'd have to be better than Manti, right? Like he would have to be better than him. Uh and I'm not saying that's not true or whatever, but like Manti didn't even like I think Manti was kind of an injury guy as well. Like there were there were yeah, injuries. Yeah, he came in, in later. Team. Yeah, so it, it just like, I don't know if he could take the starting job, but I could definitely see him being like, yeah, we're going to get you. We're definitely getting you 20 snaps a game. And that would honestly, that would be fine. Like, that would yeah. be great. Yeah, because correct me if I'm wrong. I think Jalen Smith was the last true freshman linebacker to start day one. And even with Smith, I think he started from day one because Danny Spahn suffered like a career ending injury. Like, he even had he like would have had to sit. Thing. Yeah, yeah, he had something. He was going to be sitting behind him. I mean, look. Kyle Hamilton is a, another example, like not linebacker, but like he came in and obviously he was starting caliber, but they had a Lohi Gilman and Jalen Elliott there and they were two captains. So it's like, but of course, like he played 500 snaps that year. Right. So y you find ways to get guys like that on the field. And I think they'll find a way to get him on the field. If he's, a, if he's as good as we, everyone says, it's kind of like is predicting right now or at least thinking is possible he'll, he'll get on the field he'll play a lot yeah I feel like if he's going to take reps away from anyone it's probably going to be Drake Bowen and I don't even have a complete understanding of what Drake Bowen's involvement is going to be in spring practice because he is in the middle of a baseball season with the Notre Dame right. baseball team so it's going to be really interesting to follow over the course of these next few weeks I have one last question and I I'm almost hesitant to ask because I asked you the same question last year. I actually went back and looked. You came on for the spring practice preview. <laughs> and basically, I asked you to give a bold prediction. Uh, and you said you expected Tyler Buckner to have a big spring. And that was actually pretty accurate up until the spring game. Up until when, the spring game. Yeah, That's everything right, just yes. kind of cratered. But the talk about <laughs> Tyler Buckner going uh, into that game was actually really encouraging. So that was a good pick. Mine. Okay, so so real Go quick. ahead, go ahead. J Jamie, uh, so Jamie on, um, Jamie on, uh, I don't know if it was on Power Hour or if it was on Hit and Hustle this week. He said again, and this is totally unrelated. Like, really, I didn't know you were going to bring this up because I totally forgot I had said that. But he was like, Buckner had been out. He got so many reps in the spring because he had been outplaying Hartman. He was outplaying him. But then Hartman, I think, had a, like a really good like last yeah, scrimmage. Yeah, it was that scrimmage the, when everything and, started to change. The and yeah. gold game. And then he did, that's when he decided to transfer, and that's when everything went back. So it was a correct prediction uh, up until the last one. So what, what was, was yours? It was better than mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said I thought that Caleb Smith, the Virginia Tech transfer, was going to be wide receiver one by the end of spring ball. Instead, he quit the team because he realized he wasn't going to see the field at all. That that was tough. So I ask you again, Greg. Give Very me a tough. bold prediction uh, on the way out. Bold prediction. Um, all right. Let me let me try to think of a good one here. All right. All right. I have I have one 
on on defense. I think Christian Gray. You stop, dude. You can't take mine. <laughs> oh, finish no. it. Finish it. Finish we, it. We finish it. I, I think Christian Gray. People are going to be raving about Damn. him in the uh, in the just like throughout the the proceedings. I think I think there's going to be a lot of buzz about him and uh, what he can do. I think he's they're going to put him opposite Ben Morrison, and I think people. Are going to be like, you know, uh, predictions, uh, superlatives, wh- whatever. Like, there people are going to be making proclamations, best corner tandem in the history of whatever. I, I think okay. that's what it's going to be. I, I think he's 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 prime. All right, so that's basically exactly what I have. I, I literally <laughs> said I have written down Christian Gray is this year's Xavier Watts. Where mm. last year during spring ball, the talk around Xavier Watts was. Not only is he going to be the starter, he is something special, and he's going to be one of the best playmakers on the entire team. So I feel that way about Christian Gray. And I can't even get mad at you for taking the same one as I did. If anything, I actually feel better now because my one last year was so hilariously bad that I feel a little bit more comfort knowing that you and I are seeing things eye to eye here because, yeah, I really – I just think that the the potential competition between Gray and Mickey, I think that's going to last like a week. And then it's going to be like, okay, so Gray is going to be on the field. Mickey's still going to be a critical piece. He's going to see the field a lot on defense this year. But Gray has taken his game to another level. And I just feel like um, what he could accomplish, not only this season and beyond, it's going to be right up there with Benjamin Morrison. So having those two on the field, yeah, I think it could be something special. Yeah, 100%. All right, man. We'll end it there. You can follow Greg on X at Greg2126. You can check out his podcast, Hit and Hustle, that he does with Jamie Uyama for Irish Sports Daily. It has been a pleasure, man, and uh, get some rest. This is pretty late, so uh, talk to you again soon. For sure, brother. Happy to be on again. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode. Thanks again for making Lockdown Irish your first listen of the day. I'm going to have Luke Smith back on the show tomorrow to do more spring practice preview content, so make sure you tune in to that tomorrow morning. Remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast and follow the show on X at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod. My personal X account is at Tyler W-O-J-C-I-A-K. I'll see you guys tomorrow.